What are the roles of these proteins in the cell membrane? So some of these proteins act as ion channels. Channels, openings for specific ions to flow through. Now, some examples of ions are sodium ions, potassium ions, calcium ions, and chloride ions. Have we ever learned about ions? Yeah, we were tested on it on our last exam. An ion is an electrically charged atom. So they're very small. They have an electrical charge because they, they're either metals that gave away an electron, and since it's a positive virtue to give, they became positively charged. Or they are uh, nonmetals, like chloride, uh, which uh, take, are takers of electrons, which is kind of a negative thing to be a taker, so they become negatively polarized. Now, these ion channels are specific. So there are specific sodium ion channels and different potassium ion channels and different calcium ion channels. And these ion channels can open or close. So they can be in an open state or a closed state. Again, these are really proteins that act like a little tube that can open or close, allowing certain specific ions to flow in or out of the cell. Some of these proteins in the cell membrane are called transporter or carrier proteins. They are, help transport sugars and amino acids into a cell. They are specific. The proteins that transport sugars into the cells are different than the proteins that transport amino acids into the cell. So they are specific. Now, if the transporter protein requires gasoline in order to transport that chemical, uh, then it's called active transport. So, for example, in order for the transporter proteins to transport amino acids into the cell, it requires this gasoline called ATP. And since it requires this gasoline called ATP to transport the amino acids into the cell, that's called active transport. Interestingly, the transporter proteins that transport sugars into the cell do not require ATP. Some of the proteins in the cell membrane act as enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze specific chemical reactions. Also, there are receptor sites. Now, receptor site proteins are really fascinating. You'd say, yeah, sure. Uh, they are actually very interesting. These proteins are located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. <clears throat> and they are, they are specific for certain hormones, neurotransmitters, and drugs. You'd say, what? The purpose of a receptor site is the word receptor is like the same word as to receive. So, in other words, we know that hormones affect our body, right? Just say yes. Okay, hormones <laughs> affect our body. Haven't we talked about hormones like estrogen and testosterone, insulin, and oxytocin? All right? You need to be learning all those. So these hormones affect our body. Really what we should say is they affect the cells of our body. Now how would a hormone affect the cells of our body? It actually, the hormone attaches to a receptor site, and that's what causes that cell to start doing something differently. So, uh, just to, as a visual aid, let's just again look at this picture here. So if there are these receptor sites, these receptor site proteins, are you returning back to that other page? Yes. If there are these receptor site proteins on the outer surface of the cell, this is where different hormones attach. Now these receptor site proteins are specific. So some of these receptor sites are insulin receptor sites. Some of them are estrogen receptor sites. Some of them are growth hormone receptor sites. Some of them are oxytocin receptor sites. Some of them are corticosteroid receptor sites. Not every cell in our body has receptor sites for every hormone. So now we start to understand how it's possible that some hormones affect certain cells of our body, but not other cells. For example, Estrogen affects a woman's uterus, her womb, and her breasts, but estrogen doesn't affect the heart. Why not? The cells of the uterus have estrogen receptor sites on their outer surface. 
But heart cells do not have estrogen receptor sites on the outer surface, and therefore estrogen has no effect on heart cells. Does everybody follow that? So cells can have, they might have no receptor sites. They might have one or two different receptor sites to one or two different hormones. They might have 20 different receptor sites, and therefore can be affected by 20 different types of hormones. Now, in fact, not only are there receptor sites for hormones, but there are receptor sites for neurotransmitters and drugs. What's a neurotransmitter? Neurotransmitters are chemicals released by neurons. So we've given you examples of hormones like insulin and estrogen. <clears throat> An example of a, a neurotransmitter, a chemical released by neurons that can affect cells, would be a chemical like dopamine or serotonin or endorphins. So if you've heard of those, fine, and if you haven't, okay. But these are the names of different chemicals released by neurons. How does serotonin or dopamine or epinephrine affect some cells but not other cells? It can only affect those cells that have receptor sites on the outer surface of that cell. Only those cells can uh, allow a dopamine to attach and activate a dopamine receptor site on that, of those cells. So we wrote that activation of any receptor site, an insulin receptor site, a dopamine receptor site, a growth hormone receptor site, causes changes in the cell's function. So it starts to do something differently than it did before that hormone or neurotransmitter or drug attached to it. One more thing this helps answer. Over the years, I would have students ask the following question. They would say, uh, uh, Professor Fink, I don't understand. If, if somebody takes a medication for their heart, how does the drug know to go to their heart? The answer is when you take anything and swallow it, it's absorbed into your bloodstream and it carry, it's carried everywhere in your body. But that drug can only affect those cells that have a receptor site for that drug. So if they design a drug that attaches to a receptor site on heart cells, it will only affect heart cells. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's, it, it's carried everywhere. Estrogen is carried in the bloodstream everywhere in the body, but it will only affect those cells of a woman's body that have estrogen receptor sites. It won't affect any cells that don't. Yeah, so that's what's going on. Now, uh, one more role of proteins. Elastral, recognition sites. So what are recognition sites? These are glycoproteins located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. So like receptor sites, these are also located on the outer surface of the cell membrane. Why are they called, well we know why they're called glycoproteins, they are proteins with glucose or sugars attached. Why are they called recognition sites? because they allow your WBCs, you'd say, what's that? White blood cells. They allow your white blood cells to recognize your cells from foreign cells. In other words, the question that we're dealing with right now is the following. When a bacteria enters your body, how does your white blood cells know to destroy the bacterial cell? It somehow has to recognize that a bacterial cell is not one of your, your own cells. So the way that your white blood cells are able to do that is that there are these glycoprotein recognition sites, and there's a group of them that are located on the outer surface of every cell in your body. Now, in terms of these glycoprotein recognition sites, Every single person has a unique set of glycoprotein recognition sites on the outer surface of the cells, every cell in their body. Unless you have an identical twin. Does anybody have an identical twin in the class? Okay. So unless, in the, with the exception of you then, if your brother is an actually an identical twin, all right, it might be a fraternal twin, then it's not the truth. Okay, because fraternal is no more close, similar than two brothers. All right, but uh, with the exception of identical twins, we'll have, we'll have the exact same recognition site glycoproteins on the outer surface of every cell in their body. 
There are, there's no other, in terms of the rest of you, there's not a single other person on this planet has, that has the same identical, we could call it license plate, marker, identity markers on the outer surface of their cells. So your white blood cells know what those cell, rec those recognition sites or identity markers are, those license plates. If any cell enters your body and it doesn't have that correct, identical recognition sites, the white blood cell will destroy it because it is viewed as foreign to the body. All right? So these, I, these are really identification markers on the outer surface of the cell that allow your white blood cells to tell the difference between self versus foreign. What's self, what's you, and what's not you, what's foreign. Now, not only would, uh, obviously, if a bacterial cell enters your body, would it not have the correct identification markers, and these recognition sites could also be called cell identity markers or identification markers. <clears throat> not only would the bacteria not have the correct identification markers. What if we transplanted a kidney from one person into another person? Oh. Now that kidney is made up of foreign human cells. But we just said that if, there's no two human, humans that have the exact same identification markers unless you have an identical twin. So ha th what happens is even when they do a transplant, and first of all, before they ever transplant any organ, they will only try transplanting a heart or a kidney if they can find, and here's the expression, a close match. You ever heard that term? A close match. In other words, they analyze those markers on the outer surface of the cells and if they can't find one that's at least a close match, they won't even try to do the transplant. If they can find a close match, and the close match is usually from a relative, because that would be genetically most similar, usually. But anyhow, if they can find a close match, they'll try. Even when they find a close match, your white blood cells are not easily fooled. Because they, are, they still like recognize that that's not a correct match, even though it may be a close match. And they will start to attack the cells of that transplanted kidney. And if they start to destroy that transplanted kidney, that's known as organ transplant rejection. You ever heard that term? Yep. Organ transplant rejection. That means what's causing the rejection is the white blood cells, your immune system. The white blood cells are your immune system. So organ transplant rejection is when the white blood cells attack and destroy the cells, those foreign cells making up that transplanted kidney. They will do that even with a close match. So then how do they get somebody, even with a close match, how do they get that person's body to accept that transplanted organ? And the only way that they can get it is taking drugs. They basically give them drugs called immunosuppressant drugs. Immunosuppressant drugs. Now, you'd say, what does immunosuppressant mean? Suppress means to decrease, to inhibit, to inhibit the immune response. What these drugs usually do is they lower the white blood cell count. That's how they work. They lower the white blood cell count and they hinder, they inhibit the immune response. By, uh, by suppressing the immune response, by lowering the white blood cell count, they may be able to get that person's body to not destroy that transplanted organ. Incidentally, the most common drugs that are used for this would be corticosteroids, which I have mentioned. Question. Yep. Is that, is that healthy? Well, if you needed a kidney and would die without it, yes. yes. If they say, if they're going to give you a choice, they'll say, your kidney is failing. You have six months to live. Do you want to try a kidney transplant? 
Now you could say, no, I'd rather just end my life in six months. You're right. You're right. So obviously, what you're one step ahead of me, you're quite right. Obviously, the danger of being on drugs that suppress your white blood cells and immune response makes you more vulnerable to get sick from bacteria and viruses. And commonly, what people end up dying from who've had an organ transplant taking immunosuppressant drugs is something like viral pneumonia. But at least they gave it a try, because otherwise, for sure, they would be dead. All right, if you're, somebody's heart is failing, you can't live without a heart. So most people will do you know, anything basically to see if they can tr see if it'll work. Yeah? How long do they have to take those drugs to work? Okay, how long do they have to take the drugs? What's the answer? For the rest of their life. The moment they stop taking it, the white blood cell count increases and it starts attacking the organ. So they have to take it for the rest of their life as long as they have that transplanted organ. Yep? Yeah, but that's only temporary. Yeah, but it's only temporary. You're waiting for that organ. Right. All right, it's just temporary. And in fact, if they can't get an organ transplanted long uh, soon, uh, that machine won't keep you alive. Uh, yeah. Uh huh? Do they do what? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Anything can happen. All right, so uh, th medicine is complicated. So uh, anyhow, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, the use of immunosuppressant drugs. Now, uh, one more aspect to this. Some of you may have heard of a class of d uh, diseases that are called autoimmune diseases. Did you ever, have you heard of that word? And if you haven't, you have now. Do you ever think about what it means? What does auto mean? What does auto mean? Yeah. Self. It means self. So you're immune to yourself. In an autoimmune disease, the white blood cells actually attack your own cells. Now, is that supposed to happen? No. no. But they, for some reason, something has gone terribly wrong. And the immune system, or white blood cells, are attacking your own body cells. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples of autoimmune diseases you may have heard of. Rheumatoid arthritis, if you've ever heard of it. That's where the immune system attacks the joints of the body. Another one, rheumatic heart disease. Rheumatic heart disease is where the immune system, the white blood cells, attack the heart. Another example, multiple sclerosis, or MS. Anybody know what the immune system attacks there? The nervous system. So it attacks the nervous system. <clears throat> and I'll give you one last one. Uh, juvenile onset diabetes. In juvenile onset diabetes, the immune system attacks the pancreas that makes insulin. So these are all autoimmune. I could list another hundred. Okay? <laughs> Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, Graves disease, Hashimoto's disease, uh, uh, lupus erythematosus. Uh, we could just go on and on as far as the number of autoimmune diseases. So there, this area, in order to understand autoimmune diseases, there's a lot of research going into what's gone wrong. So one of the current ideas is that for some genetic reason, and they're probably genetic factors, these people are not forming these recognition sites on the outer surface of some of the cells of their body. And since some of the cells in their body lack these recognition sites, these identity markers, on uh, maybe it's in their heart, maybe it's in their nervous system, maybe it's in their muscles, wherever it is, then their white blood cells start to attack their own body in those places where they're lacking those identity markers. So this is an area of intense research. Okay, so now we want to talk about the cytoplasm of the cell. The cytoplasm inside the cell is mostly water. It's about 80% water. 80% water. Now after water, the next major chemical that's in, that makes up cytoplasm are proteins. 
So in other words, cytoplasm is mostly, as far as composition, it's mostly water and protein. Incidentally, anything that is made up mostly of water and protein will have the consistency of jello. So if you were to make jello, the way you actually make jello is it's actually made up of a protein, um, and uh, uh, proteins from plants usually, and you mix it with water, usually have to heat it up, and uh, you just mix the water with the uh, uh, protein and jello, it's called ge gelatin, and gelatin protein, and uh, when it cools down, it has the consistency of jello. Now, uh, let's talk about cooking right now. I know that's why you're taking this biology class, we'll talk about cooking. So the weather's a little bit on the cold side, so let's say we all make soup tonight. All right, I don't care if you make chicken soup or some other meat soup, let's make soup. All right, so we're going to make it simple. We're going to take a pot, we're going to throw some meat in the pot, and we're going to fill the pot up with water. Pretty simple. All right, and then we're going to boil the hell out of it for several hours. <laughs> now, as we boil the meat, all right, what is meat? Meat is actually muscle cells. It's muscle tissue from an animal. Think about that when you eat it. So you're eating muscle cells. Now, what's happening, muscle cells are very high in protein. There's a lot of protein in all muscle cells, including yours. As you boil the meat, that uh, muscle tissue, uh, some of the proteins in the muscle cells are actually coming out of the muscle cells, the meat, and dissolving in the water. So after we boil this thing for a couple of hours, let's let it cool down and let's put it in the refrigerator overnight. So when you pull it out of the refrigerator the next morning, there's, yes, there's some fat on the surface because fat won't mix with the rest of it. And after you remove the fat, what does the rest of it look like? Like jello. So what do we know it's mostly made of? Water and protein. Absolutely. Anything made out of water and protein is gelatinous. So some of that protein that was in the meat has now dissolved in the water of the soup. All right, so clearly it came from the muscle cells, so there's a lot of protein. Now, it, many years ago, they used to think these proteins were just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. But we now understand that these proteins are actually organized into a complex pattern. This is known as a cytoskeleton. It is a network of proteins, right? So there's really a whole network or pattern of proteins. So they're not just floating around. They are organized into what's called a cytoskeleton. Just as we have a skeleton that gives us form and shape in the form of our bones, our bony skeleton, the proteins in the cytoplasm are what give it shape and form. Now some of these proteins... These, some of these proteins uh, in the cytoplasm are described as microtubules, and others are described as microfilaments. <coughs> What's the difference? A microtubule is just like its name says. It's tube-shaped. It's actually hollow in the center. So it looks like a pipe or a tube. Other proteins are thinner, and they're more like a solid wire. They're like a solid protein, like a thin wire. They're called microfilaments. In fact, your book talks about actually microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate proteins that I'm not even going to deal with. Uh, now, some of these proteins, especially the microtubules, can move. Some of these proteins, especially the microtubules, can move. And these microtubules that move are what allows movement of a cell, of what's called amoeboid movement, cytoplasmic streaming or even contraction, changes in the shape of a cell. We're going to be, uh, I actually brought with me uh, a model of uh, something containing microtubules. So these represent microtubules, tube-shaped proteins that are capable of moving. So it appears that microtubules, these proteins are the fundamental unit of movement that allow movement of cells. We'll have more to say about that. Let's talk about the nucleus of a cell. Now, the word nucleus literally means what? Center. Center. Very good. Some of you are saying, well, how would I know that? Because we told you that the center of an atom is called the nucleus, 
because all that the word nucleus means is center. In this case, the nucleus in a cell is referring to this large structure in the center of the cell. Now remember, of course, prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus, such as those of bacteria. But uh, most cells do have a nucleus. Now, so we drew a nucleus. Now, uh, just to describe my picture here for a moment, it's an amazing picture. All right, so uh, this, we, the, we have a nuclear membrane, the nuclear membrane, and the structure of the nuclear membrane is very similar to that of a cell membrane. It's just like the cell membrane, the nuclear membrane is similarly made up of a phospholipid bilayer and proteins. <laughs> in addition, though, we're going we're gonna to be seeing in a moment that there are little pores or openings. There are pores or openings in the nuclear membrane, and we'll show you another picture that shows that. Now, inside the nucleus, inside the nucleus is a jelly-like fluid that is called nucleoplasm. And this nucleoplasm, this jelly-like fluid, is very similar to the cytoplasm jelly-like fluid here. So we've got cytoplasm here and nucleoplasm in the nucleus. All right, so cytoplasm is here, nucleoplasm is inside the nucleus. And just as we learned that the cytoplasm is mostly water and protein, 80% water and then protein, the nucleoplasm inside the nucleus is mostly water and proteins as well. Anything that's made up mostly of water and protein is jelly-like in consistency. But in addition, in addition to the water and proteins inside the nucleus, there's also DNA. Now, in, also in the nucleus is an area called the nucleolus. And the nucleolus, and if there's more than one, and there can be more than one nucleolus, then it's called nucleoli. That contains the chemical called RNA. So the chemical RNA is found concentrated in this area called the nucleolus or nucleolus. Now, uh, let me just uh, mention something else here. And I wrote it here at the bottom. The DNA molecule or chromatid can coil up or uncoil. And we had learned that when the DNA is uncoiled, and it kind of looks like a wet spaghetti noodle, it's said to have a chromatin shape. When the DNA coils up, when the DNA becomes coiled up, we say that it has a chromosome shape. So these terms, chromatin and chromosome, are describing whether or not the DNA molecule is uncoiled or tightly coiled up. The endoplasmic reticulum. <clears throat> now what does the word literally mean? Endo means on the inside. Plasmic means cytoplasm, so on the inside of the cytoplasm. And reticulum means a tubular network. A tubular network. So there is a tubular network, a reticulum, inside the cytoplasm. The way that I wrote it is that there's a network of tubes or tubular canals that connect the nuclear membrane with the cell membrane. And it functions like a little circulatory system inside the cell for the transport of molecules. Now, just to help you visualize this, why don't you look at page E2II. That's this page. All right, so this is showing a cell. Here's the nucleus, and you can see that there's this tubular network. This tubular network, this network of tubes inside the cytoplasm, is called the ER, endoplasmic reticulum. Reticulum means a tubes, tubular network, endoplasmic, inside the cytoplasm. Now, there's actually two types of ER or endoplasmic reticulum, two types. There's what's called smooth ER, and what is called granular, or rough ER. Now, we'll have better pictures of this in a moment, but you've got, all got this picture. 
All right, now the smooth ER is called smooth because it's smooth. You'll notice how it's attached to a series of flat sacks. They look like pancakes. And that this series of flat sacks that look like pancakes is called the Golgi complex, named after a cell biologist, an Italian cell biologist named Emilio Golgi. <clears throat> now, uh, the importance of the smooth ER, well, first of all, the endoplasmic reticulum in general, this network of tubes, acts like a little circulatory system inside the cell. Just as we have blood vessels that allow substances to be transported throughout our body, at the microscopic level inside cells is essentially something that's like a, a blood vessels called the ER. It's a network of tubes that allows chemicals to be transported from one part of the cell to another. It's just amazing the, inter the complexity at the level of a single microscopic cell. <clears throat> now, in addition to the role of these tubes allowing chemicals to be transported from one part of the cell to another, they have another role. The smooth ER is involved in lipid metabolism. You'd say what? It's involved in the manufacturing and breakdown of fats, lipid metabolism. So this is where lipids, fats, can be manufactured, synthesized, manufactured, or even broken down. For an, ex an example of a fat that is manufactured in the smooth ER are steroid hormones. Because we've learned that steroid hormones are actually chemicals, hormones made from wh what fat? What are steroid hormones made from? Which fat? Cholesterol. So uh, that was back in section D, page D3. So uh, anyhow, uh, uh, cholesterol uh, is used to manufacture steroid hormones in the smooth ER. Now, there's a second type of ER called granular or rough ER. And it's called granular rough ER because it's got little granules associated with it. Now these little granules, these little granules are called ribosomes. And these little granules called ribosomes are right next to this tube. <coughs> Notice again how this tube is attached to a series of flat sacs that look like pancakes, again known as the Golgi complex. Now the purpose of, of the ribosomes of what's, uh, of, uh, what's known as the granular or rough ER is that proteins are manufactured. They are proteins are manufactured or synthesized from amino acids at the ribosomes of the granular ER. So now we're telling you where in a cell steroid hormones are made and where in a cell proteins are made. So we've gone beyond knowing what steroid hormones are and what proteins are. Now we're telling you where in a cell these different chemicals are made. Okay, so that's why you got to make sure you know what all those chemical names are, because now we're going to go into the cellular level. Question? All right. You said uh, that the smooth ER makes them? Yes, it makes them and even breaks them down. It makes, makes manufactures and breaks down steroid hormones and other fats. All right? And proteins are made or broken down, well, let's say made, in the ribosomes of the rough ER. All right, so that uh, uh, kind of gives us an idea of this. Let's uh, look at page uh, E3 again, because we wrote all this. In addition to saying that the ER acts like a little circulatory system for the transport of molecules, we wrote that smooth ER is involved in lipid and steroid metabolism, such as the manufacture of steroid hormones. The rough or granular ER, we wrote, is studded with, that means it's got little small bodies called ribosomes, and these ribosomes, which are made up of RNA and synthesized in the nucleolus, the ribosomes are where proteins are synthesized. That's where proteins are made. Let's say a little bit more about the Golgi complex. Now the Golgi complex, and some books call it the Golgi body, some books call it the Golgi apparatus, I've called it the Golgi complex, 
It's called Golgi in all these cases, named after the cell biologist who first discovered it. And an Italian biologist, you certainly don't have to know his name, but his name was Emilio Golgi. What is it? It's a stack of sacks. I said it kind of looks like a stack of pancakes. The purpose of those sacks is that's where these chemicals can be stored. So the Golgi complex is where various chemicals are stored and modified. The various chemicals that were formed in the ER. So both proteins made in the rough ER and steroid hormones made in the smooth ER can be temporarily stored in these flat sacks of the Golgi complex. Let me go just a drop further and then we'll try to put this story together. 